Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. I feel like I should be looking behind me, find someone with a knife. I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. Okay. Anyway, I'm glad that we're both wearing black because we are in mourning. Why are we in mourning? Well, it's not for the Queen. Although that is, of course, very close to the date at which we record. The conversation with Bill Woodman this evening is called In Mourning. Because I've been thinking about whether art is a mausoleum. Okay. And a few people have asked me, I brought this up a couple of times with different classes and uh, another group of adults. And some people ask, what does mausoleum actually mean? And as far as I understand, a mausoleum is really like a, a room or a, a building within which one puts a, or is a tomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know that. But is art a mausoleum? What does that question ask of us? Hmm. It's interesting when you first said that, whatever it was, 30 seconds ago, and I kind of thought, you know, those, you know, like in a sci-fi movie when somebody gets like frozen, the moment gets frozen in time and it's like suddenly a sheet of glass, like in Superman 2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like a prison. It is interesting that most art, certainly the stuff that we look at most of the time. Who, we broadly or you and I? Both, but definitely you and I. Right tends to be even the non-photographic stuff a snapshot of a moment in time right right and it just kind of stays there in stasis forever mm. it's like this is this thing that was made in 1955 or 1650 or the year 800 and here it is as a artifact of that moment you know in fact could be said that almost all artifacts are just pieces of art that were made and left at that time, you know? So yeah, I get it. If that's where you're going, I get it. Uh, or at least that's what I thought of initially when you said it. I thought, yeah, that's actually true. You know, the other day I was looking at photographs that I took 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking like, they still matter to me but at the same time, they just, they feel old to me. You know what I mean? Like they feel stuck, like they can't improve, like they can't change, which is, of course is true. That's the whole point. Well, we've talked before though about, um, or questioned before whether the past can be alive. But I, I've been thinking more and more that actually all things are dead things. Are you a dead thing? Well, I think that my awareness of myself is dead because it's always in the past. Because what I am and what I identify with has already passed and I relate to it through memory. True. And even your perception of the present is, I don't know, 15 milliseconds or so behind what really happened in the world. You know, even that's so being very literal about it, but essentially it is a sense that um, art, as you say, is recording a moment in time. Yep. And but isn't that what also makes it magical? Well, I'm not disputing the magic, as you know, of anything ever. <laughs> but I, I am questioning whether art itself is a mausoleum. And I was listening to a very clever person who I rather admire talking about how when hearing art as a mausoleum one could also think that galleries perhaps are mausoleum like in themselves like gallery spaces for example um sure. those clear um thoughtful spaces uh, there are lots of commonalities between mausoleum and galleries actually and even schools a lot of art schools and music schools and things and dance schools are conservatories. They're 
place is to conserve the past, not to move forward. Right. But the next part of that is really then the questioning, uh, like, is experience over already? Yeah. You know, so anything we have is had. Yes. Mm. But if that's but if that's by definition and true of everything, does it mean anything that that is true? If there's no alternative, you know. We could split hairs about chronology, couldn't we? Chronological time. Sure. I mean, your comment about 15 milliseconds, you know. Of course, I think that's pointless. <laughs> of course you think it's pointless. Just 15 milliseconds. Yeah. Anyway, um, I ask myself, do I mourn the things I want? What do you mean what you want? Well. We're talking desire, actual like meant like desires. Yes. So actually, if I was going to think of alternate titles for this. I mean, you could say the loss of desire or desiring desiring is lost or something because I, I've been very much considering that um, desire fundamentally changes and in fact kills what it desires. True. Right? And that as artists, we deal with desire quite directly. Uh, we want to show something and we move towards showing it. And sometimes we might be very successful in that, in that what we represent might be understood by the person or those who see it. But nonetheless, it's transformed because it operates like a horizon. And we move towards it and we, we can't reach it. Yeah. Anyway, the work I've got for us to look at is very much about desire. And yet here I am in mourning. So Hopper, lots of people know Hopper. Sure. The conservative, usually. Fascinating character, though. Are you saying conservative people know Hopper or Hopper was conservative? Well, Hopper was conservative in many ways, but really Hopper was actually very complex and his paintings, especially early paintings, loaded up with lots of, um, lots of, lots of agenda, <laughs> Hopper's agenda. Um, anyway, Hopper had a strange relationship with women and especially with Joe. Josephine, his wife. Um, anyway, summer in tears. Is this, is this of his wife, this one? Um, well, I don't know if they knew each other at this point. They didn't marry until... Hmm, maybe 1920 or something. I can't quite remember. But I'm not, I'm not sure if they actually even knew each other. I certainly know she was being painted. In like 1906, she was already being used as a model for other artists. Or she, or she had been painted. There's certainly paintings of her, uh, not forgetting that she was a painter herself, and that's why she actually was mixing in circles where she would be painted. It wasn't that she was essentially a paid model, or as some people like to think of any woman who poses for painting, especially pre 1950s, must be some kind of prostitute. However, um, anyway, I don't know if this is Joe, but I've always assumed it must be. And that's because of what I know of their relationship. And I don't know if you know about their relationship and what it... I don't think I do. It's like, we'll come to it. <laughs> but um, what's our relationship to desire is really what I want to ask. You know, funny thing, you said something about the, the you know, the loss, desire and loss and, and, and mourning. Yeah. I find in my own life that the things that I've desired that I no longer desire, I look at now and wonder why I ever desired them. <clears throat> and then I question why I desire anything I desire now. And am I going to think the same thing 
in the future about what I think I desire now. And that brings me right back around to why do I bother desiring anything now? Because it's probably folly anyway. It freezes me up. It really this does. This really reminds me of when we talked about your selection of love songs. Yeah. And I can't remember quite how you put it, but we did come to almost like an impasse with each other where you were describing this notion that uh, you wanted to, the reason for loving well now is so you can remember having loved. Yeah. Which yeah. I found utterly devastating, <laughs> I have to say. Do you, do you find that the things that you've desired are th anything that you've desired that you wanted that you've achieved actually gave you what you thought it would give you when you wanted it? Well, isn't that the curious nature of desire? Yeah. Um, also, I mean, we could split hairs a little bit about the difference between wanting and desiring. Sure. Um, and indeed needing and wanting. I mean, we identify uh, that we are thirsty and we also know that if we don't drink, we die. Yeah. But I can desire a cold lemonade on a summer's day. I want it. I don't necessarily need it. But how is desire different to wanting? Because it is different. Desire, maybe desire there's has a, a pattern of lustfulness or some kind of additional passion in it. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, yeah, desire involves some sort of extra something. You're right. Uh, <laughs> hormones, that's, that's, that's what it adds. Um, <laughs> oh, Bill. Do you, do you think that Hopper was desirous of what, of his models, of something, and that's why he painted? Well, I, I always feel that in Hopper's depiction of women, there's this enormous um, anxiety and frustration, even though he's painting them in a way that might present them in some other aspects as, as serene and calm, quiet, surrounding them. You know, even the painting, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a woman like a clerk standing in a large window in a corner yeah. uh, in an urban setting. You know, there's a hush around her, but her presence is kind of fearsome. And uh, I mean, I've, I've read critics and historians describing this painting, for example, as, a, as an emblem or emblematic of Hopper's um, curiosity and sense of detachment from women or women's changing roles or how he perceived women uh, was kind of- Do you think this is negatively, this is a negative or a positive perception of women? Well, this painting in particular is, uh, I find very disturbing. Why? Well, to me, it shows something of um, something highly abusive. I oh, see. I didn't read into it that way. And um, I show this painting frequently to all kinds of people. Some people say she looks calm. Some people say she looks bored. Um, do you see that as? Do you see this as post a moment? versus pre a moment? I think this is a moment and a succession of moments within which that character has been exposed and hugely vulnerable. And I don't know, you know, some people might say tantamount to, well, rape. Uh, whereas I, I might say that, you know, something bad has already happened but it doesn't mean that I don't feel that something bad has yet to come. Uh, and one thing I've always found really, really fascinating is considering where the artist actually is. You know, is, is, the, is the artist actually like in a door jam or in a wardrobe? Like, where is that artist? Yeah, in a corner next to a piece of furniture or something. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it could be interpreted that the artist is hiding. It see, it's very interesting like that you're reading into it that way. I look at this and see 
someone who, assuming for the moment that these people are in a relationship, lovers or something, that it's a hot day, maybe they've been in and out of bed all day, and she sat down just because it's so hot and exhausting. She just like sat down at the end of the bed and turned her head away. And he thought it was beautiful and he wanted to paint it. Oh, Bill, you're so sweet and naive. I just don't assume, I don't assume the worst. You you might be right. I, I yeah, I'm just saying oh, that like when I see it, that that's what I. Hang on a minute. This isn't about being right or wrong, actually, is it? No, I might be picky with you about what you say I, I, yeah, I, I find am this, actually teasing you think whatever whatever you want about this and we talk I, about I, I find it very tender actually this painting but I don't assume I rarely assume abuse you know I could imagine taking this photograph in the situation that I described is this small by the way it looks small <clears throat> not sure don't know how big it is just saying by the size of the brush strokes like on the i would love to see this in person i've never seen it anywhere where is it mm, it might be in the whitney oh really mm. all right well i'll go this afternoon um yeah it's interesting did you know let me ask you a question did you see it that way before you read discussions about it or after I've always seen this as a as a painting of threat. Interesting. Um, and actually, uh, I was speaking to my A level class about this painting yesterday, maybe day before, and a lot of them, without me telling them, came up with rape or abuse. So as I know, it's not just me. That doesn't mean that what I say is qualified. My opinion is still my opinion. But I thought it was interesting that a group of young people in discussion about this painting would happen sure. upon that reading of it. Um, you know, and, and they're not necessarily quite as cynical as I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's interesting. I'm gonna have to gonna have to go around and around on that one. I mean, I can see what you're saying. What but do that's you not think where I'm I would go originally. Now? What's that? What do you think I'm saying? Well, no, I mean, I can see, it's funny. I look at this, I look at this thing and the word I would use would be tender. It wouldn't be rape. Do you not think it's curious the way that sheet comes down? Like in just a, a, know, I, I, a total sure. fatigue of her circumstances. Her, her bare pubic hair, her, her covered breasts, and that even in itself is kind of subverting a normal, so-called normal or historically uh, usual representation of female nude. Do you, do you think in, in your version of this, though, is Hopper painting this scene as that way or this actually happened with Hopper and this woman? Oh, well, this is why the relationship between Hopper and his wife is so extremely uh, di disturbing, <laughs> but also interesting when then one studies Hopper's paintings. It's one of those things where I kind of wish that I didn't know. You know, um, I, d I wish I didn't know what Hopper was like, because actually just looking at his paintings, I've always cited his paintings as some of my favorite, really. Not the big name famous ones like Night Hops, but actually ones maybe more like this, although not this particular painting. Um, I think they're beautiful. Okay. Very beautiful. And for me, especially somebody who's not always uh, going to be drawn towards something that is so representational, these right. representations to me are brilliant. Why are you reading what's on your phone? I'm actually looking up uh, where some are interior so I can go see it. I'm sorry, I have to door, buzz the door. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to ad lib while Spell goes to get the doorbell. And I'm also going to say, even though he's not here, uh, just to get my tuppence worth in whilst he's away. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking <laughs> to our many fans. Uh, yes, and what were you going to say? <laughs> that Bill Woodman, he's completely off track. He's um, wrong, and he was such a jerk. <laughs> He's an asshole. He probably likes this because he does terrible things to people. Oh, don't say that, Bill. Even joking. It's at the Whitney, uh, and it is 24 by 29 inches. Okay. Mm. Anyway, go ahead. What are you going to say? Do our desires define us? If not our desires, then what else? Do you, um, do, you do we, do I desire always you mean is there a time in our lives when we don't desire yeah i mean are, is is every moment driven by some kind of desire uh yes but i think that that is you know i think humans are just animals like any other and we're base instincts oh, wait, no, are, no, are no, 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 that's again that, that I'm going to be really picky about that too. <laughs> oh, we're just animals, right? Do animals desire or do animals seek what they need? Right, because that's very different. Okay, so you're making the distinction. Uh, so we already made the distinction. Do keep up. I <laughs> rare form over there in, 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 in England. Um, I think that, sure, humans always desire. I don't think we always desire. But is it is it perpetual? Like, is it every moment there's something in that I talk to you, I'm desiring to talk to you, or am I? Do I just need to Because <laughs> yeah. I had, or, you know, it's wizard, you know. Think about what the the kind of, like a rationalization of desire might be and do, where do you, desire do you think that the satisfaction of desire equals happiness in some way or no, does the desire the, the, itself the reason if i come back to our title which is in mourning is that desire is 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 like the the juice of death <laughs> right sometimes sometimes you mean in the sense that sometimes when you get what you want your desire like that that it it's, in that it's, desire, it's, counter, it's counterproductive in that desire eats itself desire kills sure. itself yeah you know um to me there's there's a kind of there's a beauty in that in itself actually kind of inevitability in it um i'm just going to change the slide but i'm going to read something that i have written uh recently and uh brace yourself because it's poetry bill i know how you hate that um I met him, saw him, held him in my mind's eye, desire extinguishing the thing it chases. The frantic run and dash smeared upon the ground of lust makes breathless fear of capture and resolve. Air taken from the lung of love to breathe false hope that we might really know each other. A bit of kindness beaten down, missed. Right, so desire extinguishing the thing it chases. Yeah. By my desire of that thing, I, in actual fact, irrevocably change, transform whatever it is I am desiring. And I could speak of that, for example, with idols. Um, in, in that maybe not desiring actually, but the idolization of a person, for example, sure. I'm not really seeing the person anymore. I'm seeing my desire. And if the person knows about your desire, they themselves are going to change too. So desire and death to me are linked in a way that is, um, very uncomfortable. Well, does it mean that, are you kind of coming to the conclusion that desire is pointless? Bill, you know me, I'm not going to come to a conclusion, am I? God forbid we make a decision and we move forward to things. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I 
I'm not sitting on the fence deliberately. I, I really, all I can do is look at it and it doesn't seem to be. The question is, is it, it, it much like your idea of, you know, the present is actually always the past, which is always inherently dead because it's not the present, mm -hmm. assuming the arrow of time into the future. You could also say that, well, that's fine. It may be all these things about desire may be true, but it, but it doesn't change the fact that in life as a human, you're going to desire stuff. You know, unless you're some I think the other thing about this is monk sitting up in the mountain somewhere, like chanting all day long. But even then you're probably desiring a you know cushion under your butt. But also I think to put this additional value into desire, it's a very curious thing. You know, we can say all the usual tricks that one might play. Is desire hot or cold? People normally align it with hot. Is sure. desire good or bad? Now that's an interesting one to try and call, isn't it? Is yeah. desire good? I would generally uh, yeah, that's tough. Because hmm. if not for desire, why else do you do anything? But what I mean is that let's not put desire into a frame of right or wrong and let's oh, not does, say sure. is what that really is starting to kind of imply we have to be very careful with our language don't we and how we approach this it, it sort of implies that actually to desire is wrong and death is bad now i'm not saying any of that but i am looking at whether the things are linked yeah no yeah yeah i yeah i don't know how i feel about it I think like virtually everyone else I speak to about this, you might be a little bit disturbed about this. Why this painting? Because the thing it's meant to be is not what it speaks of. And again, in context of Hopper and Hopper's desire um, and the notions I'm considering to do with desire extinguishing itself, for example, um, this painting in so many ways has an element of tenderness in it, yet it also again has a sinister edge, it has a feeling of um, something airless. <laughs> and I mean, how old is that girl supposed to be to you? Well, she looks very young, and it's strange because this is 1921, the other one was 1909, and I think it's actually the same model, and I think. It probably, it, again, it's, Joe is so present in my mind. Jo, Josephine, Hopper's wife, they were married by this point. So I do wonder who this is because um, I'm trying to think when she was born. She was born in like 1887, maybe. So by 1921, how old would she have been? 1887, uh, 33. Could this be her? If she was playing dress up mm -hmm. i mean <clears throat> i would say that the the musculature of this person's shoulders and arms are not that of a nine-year-old or whatever you know what i mean oh no it's a, it's a woman yeah but at the same time it almost feels to me it's weird to me because like do you see it as her hair going all the way down and that's what's on the left or that she's holding something with her left arm well i mean some it's meant to be her she's meant to be stitching <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's what I thought initially. But and it me, might be I true. Have, I have her hair in the frame. But the other reading I have of this is that she's uh, <laughs> essentially got a man between her legs. And I've always thought that of this painting. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't see that. Do we know for sure that she's meant to be stitching? That's what the hand's doing. No, I understand that. And I, that's how I read it when I first saw it. Yeah. But I'm just, it also to me, like, and this is whatever, is like, it could be a little girl holding a doll, looking down at the doll. That's what, that's the other, you know what I mean? Like, it's funny. I see it as innocence. You see it as debauchery. I, well, it's not debauchery, Bill. No, that's the wrong word. But I do see it as something that is driven by desire, the erotic. I do see it as something that is also, again, this feeling of earlessness and intensity 
And I wonder about it in that we move towards this, this person, this woman. And as we move towards her, I wonder what is my desire, even as a viewer in this? And how does that ultimately change what I can see? And does it kill it in that I no longer engage with the truth of it because I can't see it anymore? Do you read the fact that we don't really see either of these women's eyes? Like they're not personified? I mean, Hopper was a shit. You know, he really was a beast. And I'm not surprised that he doesn't paint women's eyes. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if he didn't want to look into women's eyes. Yet he wanted, he wanted to um, identify them, consume them. He wanted to berate them, and particularly in the case of Josephine, to control her. Joe Nivison is the reason Hopper is famous. I mean, some people would say, oh, well, Hopper would always be famous because he was so talented. Yes, yes, yes. But there are many talented painters out there who do not become as famous as Hopper. And Hopper relied on Joe to elevate him. And she was, she was actually a, a very uh, well-regarded painter. And this is one of her paintings, a self-portrait. This is towards the end of her life. I think she was in her 70s. And here she paints herself in this kind of loose light bra. She wrote somewhere, I don't know what the exact quote is, but it was something like, you know, she, it was funny that this is the kind of lingerie she bought herself as a gift from Hopper. <laughs> so she'd taken his money and bought herself a birthday gift. And this is what she chose. And when she put it on, she, she reflected on how at that stage of her life, it was really just like a second skin. The implication being that, you know, the the breasts had started to sag and the, the skin had become crepey and so on. Um, but to me, there seems to be this end of her life, um, something of kind of like a, a brutal defiance of everything that's come rather than a resignation that one might expect to see in a woman who'd systematically been raped her whole married life. So how do we know all of that? She said so or or other people said so? I don't know enough about the relationship. It was, it was, it was. I think quite well known that they had a highly volatile and abusive relationship, um, and she wrote extensively. And I think someone at the Whitney at actually, Levin, Caroline Levin, someone like that, uh, has collated lots of correspondence and 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 done the job of a really good historian, and has been able to see that actually. I mean, Hopper's idea of having sex was to, you know, beat her and rape her. And what's what's so fascinating also, and, and of course one can speak of this from a position of privilege, not having lived this life, is that it's it's fundamentally uh shocking that she stayed with him. Yeah. And actually, people around her, you know, she's isolated from her friends. Hopper's friends didn't like her. Um, she was very plain um, and he was very grand. Uh, I, get the imp I get the impression that he was, with her, at least very tight-fisted, um, which is why I think this painting possibly is like a, a rather a vengeful painting, uh, that this is what I bought with the money <laughs> that, you know, You've allocated me for my birthday. How, do you know how, how old they were or what, what years they died? Yeah, they, they were born a year apart and they died a year apart. I think it was about uh, 60, 64, 65 maybe, each of them. Uh, him before her? Him the year before her, yeah. And he was born the year, year before her as well, I think. And you said that she's the reason why he's popular, why she was his champion. She was his agent. She was absolutely know. his champion. She had a show somewhere in Brooklyn and she had like seven or eight paint, watercolor paintings in a show. Um, she was taught by some well-established New York artists. Um, 
You know, she must have been quite a lady, actually. Uh, anyway, she'd started seeing Hopper and she had quite a lot of kind of traction around her, her work. And when the show was finishing, she'd done very well. And she just said to the curator, said, well, you know, your next, your next show should be Edward Hopper. And that, so she introduced him into her world. I mean, he was, he was already a painter, of course, but you know, the fact is, is that he didn't, he didn't have any maybe connections and he wasn't known by anyone who might assist him in, in bringing him up into a kind of public, public sphere. She did yeah. that. And also she throughout her life, I mean, she, she had obviously kept painting, but she didn't uh, pursue a career. And one might say that it wasn't just that she was overshadowed by a more famous husband. So I wonder how active he would have been actually in putting her down because apparently he did used to love doing that as well. He used to love diminishing her and shaming her. Are we 100% sure that she didn't, she wasn't, uh, I don't know, into that kind of, there are people who, you know, like to be dominated and all those things. You know what I mean? Okay. But nonetheless, the facts are that the way she described these things was as rape and essentially sure. torture. Yeah. People who knew her, um, friends who were critics at the time in the kind of 20s said that, you know, Joan Le- Everson made two great mistakes in her life. And the first one was marrying Hopper. Like it was a mistake for her. Sure. Well, the second one should have been staying with Hopper. And the second one, yeah, was staying with him. I always, I always find, I always find abusive relationships like, incredibly frustrating you know the reason why they're here though in this particular presentation this speaking of seeing is because desire drove them and it killed them and i'm not just making a tenuous link for the sake of it they absolutely embody what i mean by desire moving away from itself desire extinguishing the thing it desires desire eating its own mind somehow In Hopper's paintings, there's this thwarted sense that there's not the access to these isolated women that he wants. He wants to control them. He wants to dominate them. He wants to eat them. He wants to have sex with them. He wants to rape them or whatever. I don't I don't know that part. Obviously, I can sense it. uh, But it seems that he's thwarted by it. And I wonder, it's not just a, a, a smart ass depiction of a woman isolated or a woman shamed, or a woman resplendent, whatever way you read it, the fact yeah. is there's a barrier. And the barrier is his desire because the desire extinguishes itself in his painting of these characters, the muse. And then, of course, for me, I would start questioning, you know, what what can a muse really be then? I mean, we've had uh, an entire history that's kind of lumbered women with titles. Are, are we sure we would have, you know, maybe maybe he would not have painted any of these things had he not had those desires? Well, I think, it, you know, just to sort of bring us to a close more, um, if desire is like perpetually moving us away from desire or the thing we desire, you know, I, I would also then say that we sometimes make the mistake of confusing desire with love Um, and I would ask as artists do we depict desire much easier than we depict love so when we think about depictions of what we might lazily understand as love are we actually just looking at images of desire Uh, I would tend to say yes Okay, so I think love is very difficult to define in words or images or anything because love is not desire. Love is timeless. Yeah, it's the absence of desire in some ways. Right. And isn't it strange, though, that culturally we have the two of them together or we, we kind of feel they're almost like the same thing? Well, the fact that we put lust and love anywhere near each other they're kind of the opposite of each other in the same way as you know your your desire comment i mean yeah. this actually is quite sad isn't it 
this. Yeah. I mean, I think we also put them together culturally and socially, which is, or, you know what I mean? Which is kind of weird and wrong. Anyway, I'm in mourning. I'm in mourning for something that can't be rather than something that has been and gone. Plus you're sad about the queen. Bill Wardman. Thank you. That was fun. Bye. Now I've got to go see some hoppers. <laughs>